My name is Donald Noel. Most of you here know me. Maybe a couple persons don't know me. Um, this is Mr. Ishmael Harrell Merriman, right? And we'll be your facilitators for today along with our friend over there. Um, could you come please so everyone can see you? Could you introduce yourself? Good day everybody, my name is Connie Jones. I'm from Charleston Andrews. I'm also a CMAS farmer from the Grenville area. I'll be here to show you some ways that I can I do CMOS together with Mr. Mariman and Mr. CMOS. Now feel free to interject, ask questions. If you have any concerns, queries, you don't have to raise your hand. We're not in class, you just have to ask away. Any questions? What is CMOS? Anybody? What is this? I think we just drink. Does that? It's an algae. Mm, that's part of it. You can feel free to come touch it, take pictures. Now CMOS is, as they said, an algae. It's a marine organism. Right, and it has several uses in our everyday life. Now in Grenada and part of the Caribbean, we use it to make smoothies and so forth, but it can be used for a lot of things, a lot. Now to name a few, um, CMOS can be used to make gel, well, face masks, shampoos, additives in soup and other products like gummy bears. And that is the stuff that is used most common in places in the bigger world, let's see. Places like the US, the States, and so forth. In Grenada, we boil the CMOS, put it in our pot, we blend it, and we drink it, and it tastes good. But that's not the only use of CMOS around the world, right? Um, so today we're gonna to be showing you some different cultivation methods, right? We'll be explaining why we do some of the things that we do, and how effective it is at its job. Also, we're going to be outlining some challenges that you may face if you seek to get into CMOS production. There are several, right? And, but those challenges can be easily mitigated. Now, the system we employ, I must brag, it's one of the most productive and efficient systems. Um, it's sustainable, it's environmentally friendly, and what we use most is called the floating raft system. You'll see why it's sustainable. You'll see why, you'll see why it's economically or environmentally friendly. And we'll contrast it with some of the other methods that we'll be demonstrating here today. So we have three stations. We have one, two, and three. We'll show you what each method looks like and how to set it up. Now you may be asking, I don't know, I'm assuming that you're asking, why are we sharing such prize system with you? What, 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 what's the benefit to us? Now, one of the challenges in CMOS production is that there is limited supply. Now, we've had contact with several prospective buyers, but the problem is that we cannot supply the amount of CMOS that they're asking for. We've had persons, and I show Mr. Jones here who can testify to that, Persons requesting thousands of pounds of dry CMOS every month. I mean, we're nowhere near that capacity to supply those people. And with persons like the big companies that are buying in bulk, if they can't get that amount, they'll break it down a little. If they can't get that, they will just move on to somewhere else. Some way like St. Lucia, who's the Philippines, China, um, places where the CMOS industry is, is booming, and they'll source their CMOS from there. Pricing. Now, CMOS, we currently sell our CMOS for $30 per pound. Now, that is, I would like to believe, the cheapest, cheapest price on the market currently. Now, we can sell our CMOS for much more, 
and we will get it sold. Like I said, there's limited demand, there's limited supply, there's very, very, very high demand. But we decided that it's best for our customers at this point to keep our price at thirty dollars a pound. Now, almost everywhere else I know is at least forty dollars per pound of CMOS, and on an average plot, you can produce at least, not at least, on average, a hundred pounds per month. If you do the math, thirty dollars per pound, with no hiccups, of course, no, no major challenges with production. Thirty dollars per pound times a hundred dollar, well, a hundred pounds. I'll let you do the math. Yeah, so it can be quite profitable. It's just ironing out the, the little nooks and the little hiccups in the production process that makes it um, economical. Sure. Well, as all things, demand affects the price of the seamounts. Um, demand, now, since there's high demand, price increases with demand, right? Um, supply again. Now, the demand on the foreign market is very high. We, we get calls, we get calls. There are persons that don't know myself directly, but they have seen different infomercials or whatever it is on the internet with Mr. Merriman and I. And from, I remember from one little Facebook post that Miss, Mrs. Merriman made on the internet, everybody was asking, I want 20 pounds, I want this, I want that, I want that. So the man we know for sure is very high. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with Dr. Sebi. He was a, um, a herbalist from Honduras. And he was very famous for giving nutritional advice and so forth. As I said, he's a herbalist. And one of the things that he recommended highly was CMOS. Well, he recommended CMOS from Honduras, but you can get it other places, right? So CMOS demand is very high. Also, the difficulty production. If it's hard to produce, the price will be high, right? Um, packaging goes a long way in increasing the prices. If you have to ship the product, there's specific standards that you have to meet for not so much local, but the international market, right? And that will increase the price as well. So there are other little factors that will definitely increase the price. We'll go through our first method of cultivating CMOS, the mono line system. Mono mean one, so you cultivate system, um, the CMOS on one line. Now, we'll show you how to prepare the lines and the materials that you need to prepare the lines. Now, I believe everyone know what this is. Polytwine. Um, we just use it in the garden to tie with tomatoes. We, I, I even see this, this gentleman tying up a plant, and I believe it was you. A planting tree with this. This is, this is really, 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 really strong, right? So we can use this for several things, um, including simos. We need this, we need a scissors, we need rope. Now that's preferably ropes that are specifically made to go in water. Right, the others will work, but they will erode very quickly. So this, you can get it from any marine, marine shop in Grenada. Joe, this is us. Look at on this thing there. And the diameter you should look for is four millimeters to six millimeters. If it's too big, then you pose a challenge when you're preparing the ropes. Now, first thing that you will do, you will get this, your, your, your big roll, and then you will cut it into one foot lengths, right? One foot. Now to make this, instead of, to make this easy, what I normally do, Joe, the blue string. Since sometimes you will have to prefer hundreds of these, I don't go cutting each, the blue, the little, I don't go cutting each of these individually. I will get a phone book. I don't have a phone book with me. Well, I would get a phone book. I will wrap this string around the phone book. This is a little smaller than a phone book, sorry. Several times. Can you wrap it for me? Yeah, it helped you. Don't do it too tight. I will slide it out.
I'll hold it. I mean, it's not the right length for now. I'm not just demonstrating. And I will cut both ends. And I found that the phone book gives almost exactly one foot measurement. Right? So I can do roll it up like a hundred times that way when i cut i get 200 pieces instead of going one bam one bam one bam now what we try to do down here is try to make the production process as easy as possible so we won't be going in the water today because we don't like going in the water right <laughs> and because we don't like going in the water we try to make this as comfortable as possible most of the work is done on the land right and we basically, on average, we might spend about an hour. Not on average, actually maximum an hour in the water. If we're down here for the entire day, let's say we're down here for seven hours or so, which might be a long time for most persons, but we have generally bigger plots than usual. We spend about an hour in the water and the remaining six hours are spent under, the, well, we had a shed, but under the, the bleacher there, where we're somewhat comfortable. So we try to avoid going in the water. The water does get real cold. Yeah, so we try to avoid going in the water as much as possible, right? And we're not fishermen, we're not the best swimmers, but we're able to produce sea moss, I would say, to a high quality because we freed the water, right? So we find ways to make it as efficient as possible. So now I'm gonna have you come, come get one of these and make your way around this area. If you notice the CMOS here, there are two different colors. We have a green one and we have a brown one or a reddish color, right? Um, this is normally the color that you will find CMOS in. And when the CMOS is dried, it can be dried a purple color from this or a green color from this. So this turns green, this doesn't turn brown, but it turns purple or it can be gold. It gets gold after it is bleached. Now it's not bleached with any chlorax or anything like that. Although some people do, and that's why you have to be careful about where your CMOS is coming from. Another challenge faces, facing the industry is poor, let's say agricultural practices, like using bleach. Normally what some persons do, take this, they'll put it in a barrel of water, they'll add let's say a cup or so, I don't know the measurement, I never tried it. A cup or so of bleach and it will get completely white. Now that is dangerous, very, very dangerous. And we don't encourage anybody doing that. Now, to bleach your CMOS, we simply take the CMOS, put it on the shed over there, that, that galvanized sheet there, and we cover it down with damp proof. Or, an, or the UV plastic, right? Now damp proof works, um, we've tested the CMOS, it doesn't leave any residue or anything like that on the CMOS, right? But another food grade material work, will work best. So we put it under there and it will come completely white. We rinse it out and then we put it in the sun, right? So we don't use any, how long it takes, right? Now, from harvest, it takes about a day, if we harvest early in the morning, it takes about a day, depending on how thick we spread it and stuff like that, a day to completely bleach. A day, if it's a bit cloudy, it might take a day and a half. Now that we enter in the rainy season, it might take longer. Right? In the dry season, best time to plant sea moss. See that sea? That sea is never this rough in the dry season. Right? When well, we're getting into the rainy season, we get storms and so. The sea, the water is completely calm. The sun is shining almost entirely through the day. So when farmers on land are complaining, we are rejoicing. Because more sun for us, better production. Right? And then it takes about three days to dry. If it's drying longer than three days, the quality would not be as good. Because if the sea moss maintain its moisture for the water for too long, after it's no longer alive, because when it starts to bleach, it dies, right? It's no longer alive. If it maintains the water for too long, it will spoil. That's like leaving a sponge or your clothes in water for days. What happens is it starts to stink, it's no longer good. So you want to dry it as quickly as possible. Now, in some cases, you will get the sea moss to dry in a day and a half. If you have good conditions. On the bay here, since the, the air, the, the humidity, the wind is blowing and there's salt in the air, some of the water is sucked out by 
osmosis and so forth. I don't want to complicate it too much. And the sun, there's full sun, sun from 6 o'clock in the morning all the way to about 5 in the evening. If you have something like that, that is ideal. If you have big trees around you, then you know you're running into a problem. Right, so the strings that everyone has, I want you to tie one knot in their string. I want you to tie one knot on the both ends. Don't tie too close to the end. I have to go around there. And we're going to walk this way to look to prepare the lines. Any extra strings? Now, it will be good if you know or you're able to estimate how, how long a foot is because that will help you. You don't want to keep measuring, measuring, measuring with a measuring tape. What I, now, what I do when I started, I took, I, I took a measuring tape, I marked it on a piece of wood and I simply slide the rope along on that piece of wood marking out what one foot is. Right. Now, to prepare the ropes. We simply twist the rope in the opposite direction so you have a spacing, you have an opening. We slide the strings through and I believe everyone know, knows how to tie a slip knot. Everyone, never make kite. Don't worry. Tie a slip knot and we pull. And that is the area where we'll cultivate one piece of sea moss on this. This is our main rope, but the sea moss will be tied onto this. Right? Now we'll move along one foot. Let me measure it. One foot. Oh. Go ahead and we'll put a second one. Um, if you need to know how to make a slip knot, you need to come closer. Wow, <laughs> that's everybody. <laughs> right, you keep one string short and one string long. All you do, you take the short string, you go around, and under and up and you pull. Let me do that again. The short string goes around, under and up. Don't worry, when you're trying it for yourself, I'll make sure you're doing it right. You make the knot and you pull. I simply cut it because I don't have, I didn't have the measuring tape with me at that point. But if the string was cut one foot, and you, the spacing is one foot, one string should never pass the mark of the next string. That way you prevent any major entanglement. Now, there's a possibility that it might entangle still, but you minimize a lot of that when the measurement is quite accurate, right? And when the CMOS twist is like this, there's a lot of friction, it breaks off. So you have major losses. So there's some blue marks. Blue marks. Right, so I'm gonna have everyone, it doesn't matter the spacing for now, try to see how you can tie the string onto the line. Come on. Now there's some of the things. There are some things that we cannot teach you and then you will simply learn along the way. Right? Um, depending on the condition, the water condition, the environmental condition on where you're growing your sea moss, you will learn different tricks or you will do different things to adapt to that condition. Now, plant selection. Now, once you learn this basic thing, everything else is just a breeze. We shouldn't be spending more than five minutes on the others. This is what takes the most time and this is what we try to do in the comforts of our home. 
right now this species of seamoss that we have right here is called yukuma cottonite right this is a species of seamoss from the from the this pacific ocean now it's noted to come from the philippines but you can't be too sure about it now this it was brought in by persons from the ministry in i can't remember the name, to be honest right but a while ago now this seamoss it's in layman terms, it gels a lot to you. And that's what we use the CMOS for in the big world. Right? We're not just using it to make smoothies, but if we're using it in soups and so forth, it gels a lot more. Now, if it gels, it's kind of like a binding agent. Now, pharmaceutical companies use this in some of their medicine, and they will actually sell CMOS, rounded CMOS pills, right? That you can ingest benefit of using CMOS is that it pulls you up a lot quicker, it makes you less hungry, it helps you with weight loss. Now, oh, you know, I actually forget the major selling point of CMOS. CMOS contains 92 out of the 106 essential minerals that our body needs. That is very, 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 very good. Right, so most persons might be nutrient deficient in many ways, because of their diet, CMOS helps with that, right? Now, doctors, some doctors, we have had persons coming to us right here on the bay looking for CMOS because the doctor recommended CMOS from, for some medical condition they had, some ovarian condition with their hormones, um, uh, thyroid conditions like goitia and so forth, deficiencies. This CMOS is recommended. So it's not just for punch, it's extremely nutritious. Right? Now, plant selection. We will use a plant that has several fawns. The fawns are like the finger like projection. This is what is actually growing. So you want to use a plant that has a lot. A lot. The more you have, the better. See that one there? Where is it? No, not you. The one in the back. You see how much he has on the end? Right, so if you have a, a plant like this, that's what you want to use. Now, it's hard to tell the difference between a mature CMOS and an immature CMOS. CMOS is like potato vine. If anybody know potato vine, you take a slip, you plant it, you take a slip, you plant it, and it just keeps going on and going on and going on. Now, when the CMOS grows big, there are certain parts of it start to change slightly, but it, it, it's, it's hard to say, oh, I'm picking young CMOS, I'm picking... That ain't good, to be honest. It's always growing, exactly. So that piece of CMOS could come from a CMOS from 1987. We don't know, right? It just has been repropagated over and over and over again. You want to select one with a lot of fawns, right? And one about palm size. I know our palms might be different, so it, you have to eye it a bit, right? The bigger you plant it, of course, CMOS, it will grow faster. The bigger you plant it, it doubles in size every 10 days. So if you have, let's say the number two, that doubles in size every 10 days, in 10 days you will have four, in 10 days again you have eight, in 10 days again you have 16. If you have a number like 10, you plant it bigger, in 10 days you have 20, in 10 days you have 40, so that's like an exponential growth. It, it grows way faster if you plant it bigger. But if you plant it too big, you run into a problem of it breaking out when you're handling it to go to the water. So palm size, about uh, a couple ounces, let's say four ounces, it's pretty light, should be a, a good weight as well. What you will do, remember that slip knot? You will take, remember I said, I said knot on both ends, right? Tighten the rope for me, please. Okay, thank you. You will take the CMOS, you will take the string, sorry, you will pass it through and you will tie it onto, let's say, a strong part of the CMOS. So not on the frail, weak fonts, but yeah, it's like a thick branch. You no, know, you're climbing a tree, you don't go on the branches in the end, you go on the main structure. Slip knot. Huh? Okay, so you want to tie it. When you tie it, you want it to hang like this. So you don't want it to tie on the end like this and it hangs from the main part. Tie it onto the main part and let it hang.
Now, with the slip knot, as it's resting in the water, when the seamoss grows, the slip knot will expand with it. Right? And the other benefit, when you remove the seamoss from the water, all you need to do is pull it, and the slip knot comes through. You can use it again. You have the seamoss, you put it to dry. Normally, when we're planting our seamoss below that little thing there, we don't we don't stand up and plant the seamoss piece bit by bit by bit by bit. What we'll do, we'll dump the fresh seamoss in front of us. We'll have the rope running across our body. We'll simply pull the rope this way, tie a piece of seamoss, pull it, tie a piece of seamoss, and push it this way. When we're ready to put it in the water, we simply put it into a tub or onto a raft or onto the boat, and then we bring it into the water. So everything is done out of the sun, in the shade, where we're as comfortable as possible. Right? If that sun beats you up all day, when you go home, you're a different color. A different color, they're going to start to peel. You have one side there, No, don't want to eat Is it still? Eh? Alright. Yeah, just... No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yes, um, we had several occasions where that happened, but the CMOS is robust enough to last a long time outside of the water. Mind you, if the CMOS comes into contact with fresh water, you have like a couple of minutes to put it back into the salt water, right? It cannot handle the fresh water, right? Now, if you're bleaching CMOS, if you want to make the process faster, you dump the seamoss into a drum of fresh water and then put it to bleach. It will bleach like that. But when you do that, you not only remove the essential salt, you remove, yeah, you remove the salt that you don't want, but you remove some of the essential salt. Because all the salt, like soaking salt fish in, in water, you're removing most of the salt. Right? Um, right. Now, after this, this cannot float on its own. So that's why we require some flotation device. We avoid if you notice in the back there, I must say that does not belong to us. We do not condone using plastic bottles or any form of major debris in the water because when it gets loose, it's problems. We know. I don't think I have need to do a monologue on the dangers of having plastic and other forms of harmful chemicals in the ocean. Right? This decays over a long period of time, so it isn't, even though it gets loose, it's not as destructive to the environment as the plastic bottles will be, right? Um, this is what we're gonna use. Now we're gonna put this every eight feet. Now again, we don't need to measure every eight foot, eight feet, sorry, because the CMOS are placed one every foot. So we simply count eight pieces of CMOS and then we don't wanna tie it exactly on top of the CMOS, we tie it in and between, right? Uh, we can twist the rope again or we can simply tie it onto. There's no need, major need to twist the rope to put in this. Oh, no, no. The CMOS requires the sunlight for it to grow. Right? So, too much sunlight is bad, it will kill it, like if it's in the sun here for too long, but not enough sunlight, it won't grow properly. So if it's in the bottom, in waters that are dark and murky and so forth, it does not grow good. Now in areas where there is sand, there is um, grass and other plant life, that is evidence that the water is ideal for seamoss growth. Now we don't have any sand here because of the breakwater. Um, fortunately and unfortunately. But in places like where Mr. Jones grows his Seamoss, St. David's and Grenville, there is simply grass and sand. That's evidence. If plants could grow, the Seamoss could grow. Right? We try to keep the water. So this will be floating and the line will be submerged but not too on the ground. 
right? If the water is below three feet, that is not good for sea moss production, right? Um, yeah, any questions so far? So we'll have these flotation devices. We'll have one on each length, each end of the line. And the recommended length of the mono line is 30 feet, 40 foot, 40 feet, sorry. 40 feet could work as well, but 30 if you're beginning, 30 is good. So this should be about 30 feet. There is a flotation device on each end and it is anchored. That's the mono line, right? Now it can be anchored individually or you can have one anchor here, one anchor there, run a rope across it and then anchor it on the rope. Or you can simply use a stake for each line. Now, again, Mr. Jones is one with experience in this. They use stakes in Grenville because of, we can use stakes. Eh? They, they're real muddy, you won't, you won't stick because of the breakwater. We try using that metal pipe, but after a certain depth, we found that there, it is extreme, yeah, it's rock. So it's hard, really, 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 really hard. So we were punging with sledgehammer, but it can't go any further. So all you need to do is anchor this here. And if you want to put a next line close to it, the spacing for that line would be three feet. Now, when you're starting, please walk with three feet. If you notice that three feet is a little spacious for the water condition, the water isn't as rough and so forth, you put the space in a little smaller. But to start off three feet, you can't go wrong there. And ensure that the line isn't too loose, that when it makes a belly, as we say, it doesn't cross the other line. That's why we have three feet and nothing smaller. Now, if the water is calm, you don't have that problem, then you make it smaller and smaller and smaller. When we started with the bamboo raft, we started with two feet, we moved to one and a half, and now we're close to one foot, right? The closer the lines, the more lines you can have. So, production increases. The problem with the mono line, the major problem is that the lines you have, the lines crossing a lot of times, right? And then you'll have to use a lot of materials like this, which can be expensive. This is good, but it's not cheap. And if you want to do, I mean, it's cheap. One individual one might be cheap, but if you have to use a hundred of them, the prices start adding up. And that is the floating mono line, meaning one line system. So let's move on to the other system. Now we have the floating bamboo raft system. Everybody know what a raft is? Now, as the name suggests, it's a floating bamboo raft system. It's a raft. It's made with bamboo, and we have no other exploitation device. The bamboo works. The va bamboo, are, as you can see, there's evidence that the bamboo, the bamboo works to not only allow the system to float, but when we attach the lines in some cases, this variation we don't attach line when we attach the lines in some cases the lines keep the bamboo keeps the lines from crossing right so we can bring the lines as close as possible up to one foot in some cases if you're starting off you're new to the system recommended two feet right when you get used to it you get comfortable you can bring it a little closer right it keeps the lines from crossing so you can basically pack most CMOS in a small space, right? So that will improve your, your production tremendously, like a lot, way more. So if we have, where we will have about 10 lines on the mono line system within a certain area, and the lines are space three feet, we could have 30 lines here. That's three times as many lines as the mono line system, right? Now, the raft, is anchored on both ends. You have one major anchor on both ends, and you have what we call a Y-shaped anchor. Call it a Y-shaped anchor because it looks like a Y. You will attach it to one side, and the other side.
I'm just going to hook it here for now. But you want to tie it ideally on the bamboo. You can't tie it to the little rope, just tie it to the little rope for now. Tie it to here. Tie it. What happened? Oh, no, no, don't go around. Don't go around. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. See, it shapes like a Y. Now, that allows the entire raft to move as one system when it is in the water. Now, if you notice the rafts that are there, they are moving with the wave. So even though the water gets extremely rough, it will move with the wave and take up some of that force of the wave, the destructive nature of the wave. And that's what you actually want. If the system is too rigid, let's say, you have one anchor here, one anchor over there. This is way too rigid. When the, when the waves start hitting this, the sea moss will actually start going the one direction. The raft cannot go in that direction, so the sea moss will break off, right? Now, if the water is too, too rough, then, sorry, you can't do much about it. But try and see how you can protect the sea moss that break off. That's something totally different for now. But you want to make sure the system, the raft, you're building it as a raft. You have one bamboo, you have another bamboo, you have a next one. They're ideally about 10 feet apart and you have a bamboo to keep them in place. So you tie it on the first bamboo, the last bamboo, and it will be attached using this fishing line to all the different bamboo. Same spacing as the first one. So if here is two feet, the second bamboo will be two feet. And it's a pity that the water is, is muddy because it actually looks really good when it goes in the water. They are evenly spaced, and when this system is moving in the water, there is little to no breakage, right? This is a system that we employ. We don't employ that system because it can be hard to manage, especially in waters like this, right? We can, let's say, cram a lot of seamounts in a small space when we do this, right? Now, after we do this, there can still be instances where the sea moss breaks off, right? And we have to try to conserve as much of that as possible. Now, you can have the net completely submerged, but that would mean that you will have to have nets on the sides to prevent the sea moss from going through. Now, if you have the net like this, the, the net will be a little bit bigger, right? When the sea moss breaks off, don't worry, when it goes in the water, you will start sagging when it takes the weight, right? Um, you will start actually going down. When the sea moss breaks off, it goes nowhere. Now, in some cases, you can actually plant the sea moss onto the net. So you take that same blue string, yeah, tie it onto the net, find some way to attach the sea moss to the net itself. Now, the difficulty would be harvesting because this is so broad, collecting the sea moss. You will have to draw it closer to shore, but like I said, there are several things that we cannot teach you. You will just know intuitively while doing it. So if you're planting the seamoss directly onto this, this will be, need to be a lot tighter because when the seamoss starts getting heavy, it will sag and you don't want it to touch the ground, right? Um, let me see if I can estimate how much pounds of seamoss you can grow in this. Oh, by the way, the seamoss, depending on where it's grown, it takes on average five weeks 
to reach to a stage where it's heavy enough to have it or it's worthwhile having have it in on average five weeks now in places where mr jones grow sometimes six weeks sometimes five weeks now i like to brag again here because it's sort of in the open we have little protection the water is coming in we have nutrients coming in from the lagoon over there it takes about three weeks to grow here just three just three Right? Now normally, we'll leave it for three weeks and a half depending on how production goes, whether or not it has rain and all these little things. But three weeks is plenty of time. Four weeks, of course, it will grow bigger. Depending on how big you want it to grow, how big? Yeah, you leave it to ever, how long you want it to grow. My name is Mr. Well, Connie Jones. I I normally farm sea moss in Grenville and St. David. This is one of the ways that I farm sea moss. With this, as you can see, you'll see the lines are very closer to each other. When it comes to this, we have around this here, we normally use nets. I will put nets on all the four sides and to the bottom of this. What this will help us to do, you see, we, okay, as we talk about the same turtle problems, it will help us with the turtle problems and some of the fishes that really don't like come down in the sea moss. When, for one, well in the first case it's could be very a bit costly to do one like this. But long term it will be very good for you when it comes to, okay, good for when it comes to producing sea moss. And one of the main thing is with this, you could actually put the lines that you plant the sea moss on closer. So if you put a, you have an area about 10 feet in width by 12 feet in length, and you're planting sea moss every two feet, three feet. Every two feet, you're going to put about three ropes, four ropes. But you have 10 feet, 10 feet of a space. With this, you could actually put one line, one foot apart. If you have one line, have, okay. With this, when it comes to production, you could do a lot more production in a lot smaller spaces. All since you have the physical barrier with the netting around it, you don't have to worry about breakage. Yeah. Right? Now, if they, even though they rub the and something was break off, it's not a problem. It's right there. It's right there. Oh. Yeah, and, yeah, and with this, you could also use this as a floating device and also a submergible device when it comes to planting seamoss. When you plant the seamoss in deeper areas and rougher areas, you could take this and put it down on the reef. But also when you put it down on the reef, you have to have the same uh, the moorage system so that you could moor it in place. Even when you have it on the reef, what and a hole you might have to do when it comes to the turtles and them is literally cover it with the same netting. netting. And when I use this, I actually use the smallest net size, actually about half an inch net size on this. So with this, the turtles and other bigger fishes would not get into it and would not get tangled in it. The, okay, the same net, the, the, the nets that the guys use for seeing into old jacks and stuff, we normally use those nets for the bottom on the sides. And with this, what good about this, and you're planting this with the net, the clean, when time to clean it, you don't must take up this out of the water. You could bring it closer to shore and remove the nets and have the nets on the shore. When you, okay, like when you come to plant, you remove the nets, Put it on the shore to dry and you plant it back and you put back this back in the water. You might leave it about four to five days so the net itself could dry and remove somebody somebody dotting it from the net. Bring it back closer to shore and you put back the net in the water. Around it so that's gonna stop the heavy fishes and the turtles from coming and eat your product. And one of the good things with this is when if any sea moss in this break away, it does not go anywhere. That's when it falls down and it will literally grow there. So when you have your sea moss in this, when you come to harvesting, you do everything. You get all the sea moss that you put in here, you will get them.